Alright, what's up guys? Today we're going to be having a look at uh, Steel Division 2 and the popular question of what is the difference between automatic rifles and the LMG or what is the, the difference now that there have been some changes. So I'm going to go over a, a replay I played in with my buddy Mr. T Money Trav and we're going to have a look at some of the, the different situations where we where we can use the automatic rifles and we can't use the the LMGs and really there is only you know I would say one main difference so I won't be able to focus purely on that thing for the whole replay so I will also be looking at support equipment in general but when I can I'm going to have a, a little focus on the automatic rifles in use and the LMGs in use so this is this is me playing Rapana on balanced and T Money is playing 6th AB on Vanguard. And I skipped ahead, ahead of the deployment, which usually takes a long time for us, for us as we are chatting as we do it. So we see that um, T Money is bringing a HMG both to this building here and to the building here. And if we wait for it to deploy, and we click on the details. So I guess a thousand meters range, and it doesn't have great accuracy. It doesn't look like it has great suppression, but a lot of the time the the real effect of the the unit itself is is not exactly what you can see on the unit card. So here we get a a quick engagement now immediately between my sissy squad, which has a sniper and a GPMG. This is a unique LMG in the game because it has a thousand meters range. If we compare to the Kivari, for example, the LMG that they have, the GP28, only has 750 meters range. So the Kivari cannot engage the, the Vickers HMG here, whereas my Sissy squad can with both their sniper and their LMG. But the, the LMG has suppression of 20, the sniper suppression of 100. So if we put those together, compared to the, the Vickers suppression of 40, we might think that the Sissy Squad would suppress the, the Vickers gun before the Vickers would suppress them. But if we look at what's happening here, actually, although the Sissy Squad is doing a lot of damage to the Vickers HMG, the Vickers is actually suppressing the Sissy Squad first, pins them down, and once they're pinned down, they can't actually fire back. So the Vickers is now kind of firing for free. So these, these numbers actually are not super, I would say, super amazing. I think the bombs going down here drop onto the six pounder. Yeah, that was my Blenheim there. I noticed there's a tri Polston here. And I actually managed to get some sneaky recon squads into the south of the map here. I think without T Money noticing. He also gets a sniper there without me noticing. So we're both doing a bit of um, some sneaky plays here with units that neither of us know are there. This HMG actually does almost get pinned down by my sissy squad but now because my sissy are pinned down uh team money can start advancing with his infantry but the kavari are still there to provide some kind of um support just in case here we get an infantry gun taking out the six pounder after a napalm took out one of my other guns that was there i still had an extra one left and here we're going to get some Infantry on infantry action in the forest. I did have two Jakari units here. Uh, there was already an engagement here, I think, and one of them died. I have one left. T-Money definitely has the advantage here. So the Jakari don't have any LMGs. The Oxen Bucks actually get two of the, the Bren automatic rifles. So these are actually really nice CQC infantry squad. They get both the grenade. They get three of the stand submachine guns, and they get two of the Bren automatic rifles. The AB Paris here also get two of the Bren automatic rifles, which means they can use them in close quarters combat. And so actually, although here the Jakari does have the Molotov cocktail, which it used, actually the battle is fairly even between them because the, the Paris get these two automatic rifles that they can use in close quarters combat. The Red Suvaki here, they also get an automatic rifle. But two more Jakari come in now to support this this fight here. This is going to even it out a bit, but I think it's still going to end 
in a T money's favor. Now if we compare for example the Kavari here with the DB28 they cannot do this kind of let's say close quarters fighting as well as other units can. If we put them into the forest here they would only be able to use their rifles and their submachine guns and not the DP28. And so in that case then they would definitely lose to things like these AB Canadian Paras who have the it says anti-tank grenade but it's not an anti-tank grenade. This is a flames grenade so it's going to be best against the infantry. Team Money does win the engagement here in the forest, like I predicted. I played this game uh, a week or so ago, I think, so I don't remember exactly what happens. But it's easy enough. Once you're, once you're experienced with the game and you, you understand what units will beat what units, you can generally look and predict how things are going to go. So he does win the, the engagement in the forest here, but I do have units back in the back to prevent any major advance. And we get here now another unit, um, sorry, not unit, infantry advance. My infantry gun shoots at them, manages to pin them down before they can advance too far. And so in this kind of situation here, like, if you want to advance with your infantry, that's fine. But make sure you have something to support them, because open areas like this are the perfect place to place support equipment. And by support equipment, I mean infantry guns, anti-tank guns, snipers, uh, LMGs, or the um, MMGs, or HMGs, like the Vickers here. So this is a good place for the Vickers. Playing Rapana, I don't really get many vehicles, so I am just holding this objective here with my Kivari. Actually, I think um, because they're standing still, I think T-Money actually can't see them. So I'm, I'm holding this objective with invisible infantry because when they don't move they get a nice stealth bonus and they're difficult to see. I did get my my recon infantry and my lati into the forest here and I put my lati in a nice line of sight here where they have so far managed to kill one jeep and anything else that comes down this road will also be able to be sniped because if we check T-Money's view he thinks the front line is here, but I already have units here because they are recon and because they are the anti-tank units, they don't show up. They don't affect the influence line, so they're difficult to see. And I did spot this Tripolston and I bring out my 155mm artillery to take it out for free without any danger to me because this thing absolutely wrecks infantry. If we look at the HE shells, it has 750 meters range, 915 rounds a minute. And any infantry I tried to send across this road here would be annihilated in about 3 seconds flat. So I put another sissy here. With the sniper and the LMG, this is the perfect kind of range to prevent any infantry from crossing this gap here. So without any supporting equipment of his own, there's no way for him to push infantry across this, this space here. Same reason I have the anti-tank gun here, prevents any vehicles going down the road, and the Sissy and Kavari prevent any infantry um, assault, or at least any small infantry assault. So I reinforced the, the forest here, and T-Money did not, and so my reinforcing Jakari managed to take it back, take out his, his units, and now he just has two units left in the forest here. AB Canadian Paras with their automatic rifle. It still works well at the, you know, the 750 meters range. It just has this kind of, let's say, omni roll. Beta Slicer, hola, welcome to the, to this, the video or stream and or stream you requested. Nice to have you here. Nice napalm onto the Ratsuvaki there. But the Jakari come in here and take out the AB Canadian Paras. The air landing there won't be up for much of a fight. So let's look at the, the center town here. So in this case, what I've done is I've put CQC infantry behind buildings as a kind of failsafe. We've got the sniper covering this line of sight across here. And although the, the snipers, you know, they, they do well at a thousand meter range. If we watch this here, as the oxen books come into the line of sight, they start getting sniped. They start getting pinned down, not only by the sissy here, 
but also by the sniper on the hill here. This is a fantastic house to put an MG, a big MG, not the LMG, or a sniper in. And you can prevent all kinds of infantry pushes over here with that. So the Lati here now also taking out a Little John, I think that is. So this is a very sneaky position. It's a very sneaky thing we can do with recon and anti-tank infantry. Okay, the mortar here. This is, I think, another good example. This is effectively the same thing as an MG. And the way I like to think about it is if we take away the if we take away the graphics, okay, we take away all images, all games are essentially just built on numbers. It's all maths. And so when we when we really look at it and we think about it in that way, this um this mortar, although it has a three thousand meters range, it doesn't really function very well at three thousand meters. Its its accuracy is going to be pretty bad at that range. The dispersion of the shells is going to be quite wide, and so you're not really going to be hitting the things you want unless there's a huge clump of infantry. If you want to target one unit with this mortar, then like Team Money has done here, you bring it in close to about a thousand meters, and it is going to be just as accurate as an HMG is going to be. So he's got a He's got an assault going on here with a Tetrarch a Little John and some supporting infantry. I only have two infantry squads defending. But the problem we have here is that by clumping his infantry units up, he asks to be bombed, essentially. And this is why we don't most of the time want to clump our units up unless we can definitely uh, defend them from uh, air attacks. So in goes a, a rocket plane, stops the, the little John's machine gun, um, only gets the engine stall, doesn't destroy it, not a great hit by the rocket plane. But uh, the, <laughs> the infantry are now also gone. And this is, the, this is the problem of why we don't want to clump our units up. So having attacked too too often here in the north town without re without reinforcing, everything has kind of gone sideways for Team Money. In the south here, I send up one Ratsuvaki squad, which will just push this influence line up a bit. Now the little John comes in here, and both of these squads are are pinned down. I don't know if the little John can see the Kivari squad. Yes, it can. There we go. Once it spots, it starts shooting, and these sissy are going to be pinned down too. Now with the, the automatic rifles, the M and S here means that they can move and shoot. I can't help it, I've been asked, I've been sinking $5 into the Nemesis Toulon DLC, and I love the Kriegsmarine infantry. Yeah, those infantry are really, really nice. I think both the divisions in that new DLC are very, very strong, with some excellent infantry on both sides. So now here, this, this Oxen Books with the automatic rifles, it could even be moving and still shooting at the same time. In fact, now it does start moving, but I think it's moving because it didn't spot the sissy. The Tetrarch goes past the buildings here, gets hit by the anti-tank gun, and bye-bye, Tetrarch. So now one depleted squad of Oxen Books advancing into these two infantry squads. Actually, it does have the advantage because they're both kind of suppressed. This is not suppressed. I don't really have any way to stop this from advancing and um, surrendering these two, two units. So what I do is I bring in a bomber and buy and buy Oxen Bucks. There's no real other option for me to defend this uh, territory then. If these two units had advanced as well, I would have uh, lost that position. Fortunately, they, they didn't do that. Oh, is this a replay? Are you casting this on? Yes, I, this is a replay I played. It's much easier, I think, to, to find specific situations to, to point out where things work well and where they don't um, in a replay rather than actually just playing the game because I'm sure you know, having played Steel Division 2, it is a stressful game. It takes a lot of focus, a lot of real intense focus sometimes, and 
trying to talk about what you're doing while playing the game competently is it makes me sweat i'll be honest it literally makes me sweat so it's uh in, in terms of like explaining things the replay is so much easier to do you can pause you can look at things and you're not having to focus on actually winning the game at the same time so the mortar here you know this is this is a good use of the mortar but it just fires one barrage and we see the the influence line does get affected what we can do is if we look at t money's perspective here in this case we have the mortar and we know there are infantry units here in fact he should know from them firing that there are infantry units in these buildings which have now been destroyed and in the windmill here and so instead of just firing once what we do is we can press t hold shift and we can click twice on these buildings and twice on the windmill and then this mortar is going to fire four barrages and we don't need to to look at it again we don't need to do anything with it it's going to take 30 seconds to a minute to finish doing that but it's going to be hitting the things that we know definitely exist and not just you know one barrage which sometimes is not really enough to to do everything we want it to do so this north has kind of been lost now for the tea money here is a very large assault in the south yes i agree this game sucks to play <laughs> Just kidding, but casting games post-fact is so much better. Ever heard of fellow Twitch streamer Alpha Bird? Alpha Bird? Can't say I've heard of Alpha Bird. I've heard of Angry Bird. The the only other streamer I really watched a lot for Steel Division 2 has been um, El Bowser. He used to play a lot of 1v1s. Um, but you could see, even though he's like a, a pretty much a top-tier player, even for him... Um, explaining what you're doing while playing is hard. It's really hard. Okay, now let, let's look at this. This is... I knew this six-pounder was here because it shot at something. I think it killed my, my infantry truck here. And I only needed to spot this six-pounder once. I mean, even now I can't see it, right? If we go to my, my perspective here. I can't see the six pounder, but I mentally noted its location and then I can target the the artillery where it is. Now, the counter to this is that if you have the, the six pounder and it shoots something, then you move it to a slightly different location. And at least that way, if it is targeted by artillery, you know, it won't be dead. In this case, it is going to be dead from my artillery. This Lati is in a really nice spot anything coming down the road already two kills I think so I put the Rajakari now these Rajakari I think are another good example of the the DP 28 in close quarters combat because we are going to get some close quarters combat in this forest with these units here and they do have the the Molotov cocktails which are fantastic CQC um, weapons against infantry but also they're kind of like, um, let's say, an omni-roll unit there. They're quite interesting. Bowser? Yeah. His name is L. Bowser. Um, just search him on Switch. He, he used to stream uh, Steel Division much more than he does now. Now he mostly does um, Hearts of Iron 4, if you know that game. But uh, he's a Division 1 player. He's uh, at the top of the... Uh, ranked leaderboard if you have a look at that in game he's a very good player overall he might still have um his steel division 2 videos saved to his twitch just l bowser e l bowser like you like you typed it so these rajakari um they're quite an interesting unit you can't bring them with any any veterancy here comes the lati let's look at this this line of sight, beautiful. Tetrarch comes in, one Tetrarch down. Starts firing on the second one, gets a hit. Needs one more hit for the kill, bounced, bounced. Bounced again, this is sad. Bounced again, bounced four times after that first hit. Reverses them, brings in the Mosquito. They get napalmed, I'm not sure they're gonna get out of that alive. AB Sniper gets to come through this road now because they've been pinned down. 
This is a, a nice use of a bomber to allow your units to advance. The, the six pounder there is gone. So now in come the, the tetrarchs and I don't actually have anything uh, that can take them out. My, my anti-tank rifles are gone. Bit more of a build up in the north here, but no assault. One single mortar is holding this objective here. But let's see these Rajakari. So in comes the, the infantry assault. I moved the Rajakari back because I know one squad is not going to fight uh, all this infantry and the Daimler Little John. And I tried to put them back into the forest here because this way, at this angle, if the infantry come through the forest here, they'll be able to throw their, their Molotov cocktail and then engage in that CQC combat like this. Here we go. Off goes the Molotov, but the, the AB Canadian Paris also throw their Willy Pete. Flames versus Flames, but the, the Paris win this one. Do get the, the second uh, Willy Pete from the other squad there. And now the second Rajakari squad in the back catches the AB, AB Canadian Paris out in the open, engages with these two, will throw its Molotov, pins down one of them, gets hit by another Willy Pete. This Rajakari is now also down and out, I would say. Might be able to get him to fall back and escape. Yep, does get out. And I have some Bafsis here coming up to to help but probably versus the the little John they will lose that fight it fires very fast get the turret stuck on the first bath C second shot kills I do get some nice suppression and hits on the infantry with the bath C it gets bombed it's gonna get shot by the little John down it goes but have managed to in some way stall this this assault here now the Sissy Kievs, Kievs, Kevs, they don't have an LMG, the Ratsuvaki, they have the automatic rifle. So they are actually just using their SVT-40s at the moment, they're not quite in range to use their submachine guns, now they are. They're going to take flames to the face, but they are going to win this engagement. And this is, this is an interesting play I think here. So I have... I have a Regikari unit, and I have a kind of a fight going on here against infantry that I'm not exactly winning. And these guys, they do have Molotov cocktails, they do have the DP-28. So I could use these units to assist in this fight here. On the other hand, I also have a tank here. And the problem with tanks is they are pretty much blind. The tank here by itself, without any thing to assist it with vision is going to be fairly useless in some respects. So I make the decision here to to not send the Rajakari off to the right, but instead I'm going to bring it to the left just for the for the purpose of vision. Now if we look, at the moment without the Rajakari, this tank cannot see anything. And we know there are vehicles coming down this road. We can see that from the neutral perspective. But the tank can't see them. So by moving the Rajakari up here, I hope that I will be able to spot those vehicles and the T-26 will then actually be able to engage them. So here comes the Rajakari. Spots the truck. Now the tank can fire. And although I'm, I'm kind of losing this fight on the right now for that, I get this kill on the CMP and I'm going to get this kill as well on the AB Canadian Paris as well. So this is two, two infantry kills here. I could have assisted in the bottom here and maybe helped with killing these two or three half health squads but by taking the other decision to allow my tank to be used effectively I got two full health squad kills instead. The <laughs> I love this artillery 155 millimeter artillery coming in pounding this thing here all, the infantry all all pinned down now boom big boom love that I do get the encirclement here, but the problem, another transport kill with the T-26 there, 
beautiful. That has absolutely paid itself off. This is a 15 point tank. 15 points. And those 15 points, by using the, the recon effectively, have killed about 100 points worth of infantry. So that's very, very good use. And he had to use a 160 point plane to take it out to stop it from doing that. Now I was saying these these AB Canadian powers they have the Raider trait. And what that does actually is it does something special and it prevents the the influence line from collapsing unless there is extreme influence line pressure around them. And if you if you play around with this you'll you'll get to see how it works. Um, but essentially it's like having a leader. If you have a leader the influence line won't collapse but the same thing happens if you have the raider trait on your infantry as well. So although the they get bubbled here, it doesn't collapse and it immediately rejoins fairly easily. That is one of the nice things about the the raider trait on infantry or in any unit. Even if they get surrounded, even if you get encircled, um, they're not going to really suffer from that so much. Oof. Direct hit from the artillery onto the infantry there. That was a very nice shot. So this assault has been pretty much stopped. We get another HMG going on here. Now another one of the reasons that the the machine guns were given this this hundred meter um, let's say firing exclusion zone was because the after the the patch let's say it's quite a while ago now but essentially after one of the patches the especially the MG42s, the support equipment, not the one that the infantry gets, the MG42s had extremely high suppression. And their suppression was so good that you could actually put them in a forest, in a heavy forest, you could put two of them together in a heavy forest, and they could engage normal infantry squads and win. Which is not really how you're supposed to use them, right? You would think you have a 10-man a squad of infantry, um, they would be able to effectively encircle or you know somehow take out a, a MG42 in a heavy forest because there's plenty of cover, right? But because of the way the the stats were with such high suppression, it, it wasn't working that way. So then, by giving these MG42 support equipment this hundred meter exclusion zone, that way, then if they were in heavy forest and they only could fire within that hundred meter zone, now they can't do that and they don't work like that. Because the developers don't want, want them to work like that. They want them to work as this kind of long-range, anti-infantry, anti-soft target um, zoner. You know, they, they get that 1250 meter range. And so, you know, you want to use them within that range to prevent enemy um, infantry transports from coming down the road, to prevent infantry from crossing open areas. And, you know, that's... That's how the developers wanted to be balanced, but it wasn't working like that. So they gave this 100 meter exclusion zone first to the, the MG42s and the other um, HMGs, like the Vickers. And now they've also applied it to some, uh, some of the LMGs. Not some, all of the LMGs. So now things like the, the Ratsuvaki, which have automatic rifles, these still work really well in close quarters combat whereas things like the let's see if i have any around here things like the kavari with the dp28 they can't do it so well and really in like what say you of small v large caliber rt and especially of those captured russian anti-tank guns that can fire indirectly okay it's a good question small versus large caliber artillery most of the time, small caliber artillery is a waste, in my opinion. And the reason for that is, especially things like the, the 76 millimeter artillery, the, if we look, let's, let's choose the, let's pick up here. So this 155 millimeter artillery, the blast is 7,200. Let's compare to the 81 millimeter mortar, the blast is 4,000. So it's almost double, right? The 76 millimeter artillery has even less blast. And essentially what that means, the way it functions in games in like in practical terms, is that when the shell lands, 
it has an area of effect. And anything outside the area of effect will not be affected whatsoever, will not take any damage, will not take any suppression. So the larger this area effect, the more things you can hit, but also this increases accuracy. Okay. If we think about that, if we have, if we have a, um, if we have a circle this big and the explosion radius is also this big, then your, your accuracy actually is a hundred percent because no matter where you land within this circle, you're still going to be hitting things because your, your blast radius is so big. Whereas if we look at a, a mortar at 3000 meters, so let's see, where's it 3000 meters? It would be about this road here. If we try to fire with this mortar at this road here, the, the accuracy circle is going to be really, really big. And each blast is going to be quite small. And so what that means is because it's RNG it's randomly generated where these things are gonna, gonna land. You actually can have situations where you fire 10, 10 shots into this zone and you miss 10 shots out of 10 shots. And that, that is really bad. You know, especially when you're playing a match where it's kind of, it's kind of down to the wire. When you play against players who are just as good as you and you need things to work, you need things to hit, you need things to suppress because if you spend your points on something and those points don't do something, you are now down the points that you spent. So if you spend 80 points on a mortar and that mortar doesn't hit anything, then you are now down 80 points from your opponent. And in like, in terms of competitive games, um, the way people think about it at the, the higher levels is, is something we call trading. If you don't, if you don't know what trading is, what we, all we're doing really is we are comparing numbers. How much can I kill with this unit versus how much did I spend for this unit? So if we spend 100 points on a unit, we need to get at least 100 points of kills for that, for that unit to have been worth the buy. And that's, that's the, the idea at its most basic. So if we spend 80 points on a mortar and we don't get 80 points worth of value out of it, then we're essentially shooting ourselves in the foot. We're throwing points away. And, but this is, this is just when we get really down to the wire. This is at the, the competitive level. But if you want to be good at this game, this is something that you have to think about and you have to consider is getting the most value out of your units. So if we look at, say, my 155 millimeter artillery here, it has a radio. I think it costs, if I remember correctly, 115 points to buy. Now, I killed already a Tripolston here and a Six Pounder. The Six Pounder costs 50 or 60 points. The Tripolston costs maybe 80 points. So just with those two kills, just with those two kills, I can say that this, this 155mm artillery has been cost efficient, positively cost efficient for me. I made good trades with it. And it didn't only kill those, it also managed to suppress and kill some of the infantry units down here too. That was just extra value. If we take, for example, the, the PE-231 here, this is something that is, is hard to get good value out of. And that's because it costs 140 points. So I need to kill 140 points worth of things, tanks, because it shoots anti-tank rockets with this thing. And most of the time, you're not going to get 140 points of kills in your first run. I think this one I have asked to shoot at some of these Cromwells. These Cromwells are 50 points each. Okay, 50. So if I kill three of them, I've only gained 10 points. And I'm probably not going to kill three in my first run. So essentially, this plane has to go out, shoot its missiles, kill something, make it back safely without being shot down, repair, rearm, come out again, shoot something and hit and kill something and go back safely again and repair and rearm. And then maybe on the third run, if I get another Cromwell kill, it will then be efficient, but that's going to take a long time, right? Now, it doesn't really 
work exactly like that because we can't measure value only in kills. We can measure value in in health damage done, which we can't see, but we can see when the, the model changes. We can measure value in suppression, in making things fall back, in holding on to an objective so that we win the game. It's not purely in terms of kills and losses, but a lot of the time we, we think of it like that, but we have to try and find some way of making sure that these points we spend give us back the value that we spent. Because if our opponent is getting the value out of their units and we aren't, essentially we lose the game. That's how it's going to go. And we'll see at the at the end of the replay here, when we look at the kills and losses screen, we will see that I have many, many more kills um, in terms of points than my opponent does. And that's why I can have so many more units on the map than him, ultimately. I have a lot of units in here. There isn't really much way for him to take this forest now. I have con total control of this hill, total control of the town here. And I think he does have enough units to attempt an assault. But trying to root out all the infantry from from this is going to be hard work and not really fun, to be honest. He is trying to advance with some air landing in AB Canadian Paris here. The Ratsuvaki in the building here is preventing this, you know, this movement. If we look at the building, it doesn't look like it's got a great line of sight. But actually, we only need it to prevent units coming down this road which it does. And the Kavari here, they also prevent units coming down the road. Nice line of sight here. The sniper in the church does the same thing. The sissy over here does the same thing. And then once we've prevented things coming down this road, we then also need to prevent movement from this town into the buildings here. So we have the Ratsuvaki here covering the road here. We have the Ratsuvaki here covering this side here. And so now as they try to, to make this, this kind of leapfrog, they get caught out by the Ratsuvaki, and now they're, they're being shot in the open. They could just go for the for the move order, but they take extra damage from that as well. So the to go back to the original question, I think I got a little bit sidetracked explaining a bunch of things there, but the original question of small caliber artillery. No, small caliber mortars, yes. And the reason for that is the difference between the the artillery so when you say artillery i'm thinking howitzers and i'm making a distinction between howitzers and artillery sorry howitzers and mortars the mortars are generally worth it because you can get good value out of them and the reason you can get good value out of the mortar compared to the howitzer is that the mortar fires like four or five times faster and it aims four or five times faster too. And now it can't fire as far, which actually doesn't really make a difference because if you try to fire at a long distance with a small caliber howitzer, it's going to be really inaccurate anyway. And then we come back to the same problem of the, the small blast radius with that huge accuracy um, circle, meaning that you can almost hit nothing. And when you do hit something, you get two hits and it, you know, the infantry squad loses two men and nobody gives a shit, really. It's just totally ineffective. Whereas if I use the, sorry, no, I'm going to stick to talking about the mortar first. The mortar, on the other hand, as long as we use it, not at super long range. So this, this is, if we fired this mortar into the forest here, that's about 1500 meter range. That's acceptable. You shoot into this forest here, you're guaranteed to get some hits. And because it aims quickly, it reloads quickly, it fires quickly, you stack the order. So you hold shift and you press, t well, you press T, you hold shift and you click two or three times in an area, maybe not exactly in the same area, maybe in exactly the same area. You can space it out. It's up to, the, up to you in the situation. But you do that and the mortar, you can just leave it alone. You can go and focus on the rest of the match and the mortar is going to fire uh, 20 or 30 shells depending on its ammunition and it's going to be able to do that very quickly and those 20 or 30 shells are going to be raining down on these on these infantry definitely hitting them because of pure saturation but also because bringing it closer the accuracy isn't that bad 
and then you also have the 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 smoke that you can use from it as well now the problem is though because it fires quickly you do oftentimes need a supply truck if you want to keep using it that's that's up to you you can get a lot of use out of mortars and especially for some divisions that don't have strong infantry using mortars is kind of a a requirement because instead of having to use your your infantry to clear out a forest to advance through it you can instead just do a kind of rolling barrage of two mortars ahead of your normal infantry going in and anything that's in the forest or ahead of your infantry is going to get hit and suppressed and as you move your infantry and in, you can get the surrenders the the russian anti-tank guns that can fire indirectly you can use them pretty well and they can be put to good use but here's the the caveat of that most of the time we buy that gun because we want some anti-tank and one of the the strengths of an anti-tank gun is stealth it can hide in a forest it can stay unseen and hidden until a tank comes along and then it can pow get the ambush get the side shot get the rear shot whatever whatever you need to do you have this advantage with anti-tank guns tanks can't hide so they have armor anti-tank guns they can hide and that's how we use them best so if we use the the russian i think it's the the zis 3 right if we use the russian zis 3 for its anti sorry for its um indirect fire the the muzzle flashes give it away you can see muzzle flashes on the map um whether you can see the unit or not so you know my 150 millimeter here if we change to t money if this is firing, we will see that muzzle flash. And that's how we engage in, in, in counter battery, essentially. That's how we also take out um, anti-air units, is we look for the muzzle flashes, we look for where they're firing from, and we can then either bomb it ourselves, or we can um, counter battery, use our own artillery to fire on that location. We don't need to actually have the unit revealed to be able to, to take it out. So when we when we use the, the ZIS-3 for its indirect fire against a good opponent, you're going to be revealing your unit and they're going to know it's there and they're going to bomb it with a, a heavy bomber or a light bomber or they might just hit it with artillery and then you're not going to have that gun there for its main purpose, which was anti-tank. So I'm not saying you, you can't do it or that you shouldn't do it, but that you have to bear in mind that there's this give and take aspect to it. So here come this is this was three three PE twos, which is what two eighty four hundred and twenty points, and they took out three Cromwells. That's a really bad trade. Unless I keep using these these PE two thirty ones and get many many more tank kills. In terms of points, that wasn't a a great trade there. But on the other hand, it stops these tanks from going anywhere. So I do have that that advantage. Gain control of the forest here. Take out this air landing and take this objective back. And that's going to cut the timer down to a 59, 4 minutes down to 2 minutes. Okay, good look. Here's my, my artillery is firing here. So we can have a look at the, the muzzle flash. And we can see the, the anti-air as well. Look at this. We can see that it's right there, and there's a bigger one there. And when the artillery fires over here... There it is. Right there. And this is what, this is what experienced players do. And so, if we, want to, if we want to counter this, then we have to move our units after firing. Now, I know Team Money is not an experienced player, so I don't do that. I was playing against a better player, I would be moving my units very regularly. And we can even queue the order for that. If we want to do that, for example, with my artillery here. I take my artillery, I press T, ask it to fire somewhere, I hold shift, and then I right click nearby. So for example, I click on my artillery, 
and I press T, I'm going to ask it to fire here, right? Then I hold Shift, and I right-click, let's say here. After it finishes firing, it will then move back to here. And that way, if there is any counter battery coming, if my opponent does send a heavy bomber, the bombs and the you know, barrages are going to hit this area, and my artillery is hopefully going to have made it over here and will be safe. And we can apply the same principle to the anti-air units as well. Because taking out anti-air units by artillery is very, very popular, and it is a strong counter. Do you 1v1 or 10v10? I do both. I like both. Mostly I just play Rapana, to be honest, but um, they're both very different. You know, the, the 1v1 can be quite intense and quite stressful. Whereas by, by comparison, the 10v10, actually, because there's this saturation of players, you can practice different things that you can't practice in 1v1. So like in 10v10, I often like to choose a part of the map that is like heavily forested, and I can practice then my CQC infantry skills. And you know we can actually think that there isn't much of a skill to doing it, but when you are purely focused in this role of CQC infantry and taking heavy forest, you can see that there is some some nuance to it. And just by practicing one particular side of the map on um, Tannenberg, for example, I actually learned a lot about using my divisions much, much better because we don't have to focus on so many different areas of the map. And by practicing the same side again and again, you know, I would succeed in some engagement and advance, and I would reach a, a stage there where I couldn't advance further with the units I had. And so then I realized that I would have to not only bring the units that I succeeded with and succeed with them, but I would also have to bring a, a second wave of units behind them that are different and can do a different thing. And talking specifically, what I would do is I would advance with my CQC infantry and I would take control of a big heavy forest. But then the heavy forest would open out into this kind of open area where they, they can't go. They would just get annihilated by, by uh, anti-infantry guns, by tanks, by machine guns, or whatever. So I, I would have a lot of CQC infantry and nowhere to go with them. So then what I realized I had to do was not only bring the CQC infantry to win this fight, but once that's done, be ready to bring anti-tank guns and anti-infantry guns and also um, radio units to use my artillery better. And then once I can advance through this forest, I can then put my, my supporting equipment on the edge of the forest and start then exerting control over these open areas. And so I got a lot of practice of being able to do that in 10v10 because I could focus purely on doing that, purely on the same part of the map again and again and again. And I found that practice to be really, really helpful, to be honest. It was um, it was very fun. I enjoyed it a lot. In fact, I think I have a, um, a video on YouTube of me doing that. It's called... Um, an intermediate guide, the long and the short. I think I think I'm playing Rapana in a 10v10. If you want to have a look at that, and we can see there, I get some really nice use out of um, recon and artillery in that match. Usually, I just play uh, 1v1 these days to either teach people how to play, or just with my friends who who, who want to have a game. Um, a lot of the time, I don't really play Steel Division 2 so much anymore. In fact, it's almost exclusively teaching people. I mean, I'm happy to teach. It's a, it's a really good game, but it's hard to learn. And I like helping people to, um, to enjoy games. So if you'd, if you'd like to play 1v1, let me know. I'd be happy to do that. So here, this is what I was talking about in the, the trading side of things. 910 kills, 2,220 points of kills. You can win a game with a points advantage of about 300. 
300 points you can win a game on. If you're good, if it's close, you can win a game on that. Once it gets to 500 and above, and it's equal skill, then one side has already won the game pretty much regardless of whether they have taken the objectives or, or anything like that because 500 points is just too many units if they are used well. Once you get to a thousand, that's an overwhelming advantage. Okay, so we're looking at it from um, T-Money's perspective here. Now if we, if we look at the, the trading efficiency, this Tempest MK5, for example, costs 125, 130 points. It managed to kill an infantry gun and a small caliber anti-tank gun. Those cost 50 and 40 or 30, 30 points, I think. So he spent more points than he managed to kill with this plane. Two bombers with this one, that is efficient. That those are 90 points apiece, I think. 1v1 me, I always play with ally boss because I find it hard to play the whole map. Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. AB Paras here. Yeah, we can do a 1v1, but I actually have to do some work in about 15 minutes. But if you want to 1v1 later today, I'm happy to do that. AB Paras here, good kills. If we look at my side of the kills the um sissy squad here with the sniper two infantry sniper another infantry squad five kills for one infantry squad the lati with two tetrox and an hmg the sniper squad here with one two three four infantry squad kills by itself the artillery like I said the tripolston the six pounder also got a tetrarch and ab canadian paras this is 60, 50, 80, 30. This is about around 200 points um, of kills for 115 point artillery. The T26 here that um, I showed with the, the recon and the transport sniping, fantastic value. This is a 15 point unit, 15 points, but used effectively, it killed 150 or so points of units that's 10 to 1 maybe even more than that okay we are all done for for this for this stream this was by request for for mr mr what's his name i forgot Unfortunately, I am USA, so I'm going to sleep. Our 1v1 will be very laggy. Well, actually, I play with... Um, I mean, Mr. T-Money Trav here is also USA, and although it lags sometimes, a lot of the time it, we, we play just fine together. So, no, I think it could be... It'd be okay, I think. So this was for Mr. Beta Slicer or Beta Noob. I think that's the Discord name, right? This, this stream slash video was by request. So I hope that helps to, to understand some of the differences between the, the automatic rifles and the machine guns and what the main difference was. Mr. Evan Dora, yes, Mr. Evan, that is you indeed, yes. So this was by request. I, uh, I hope that helped. If you have any more questions or you'd like, to, uh, like me to explain anything more about the game, I'm happy to do that. But I'm going to stop here. I do have to, to do some work very soon. So... Thanks for the request, thanks for coming, thanks for watching, and I uh, hope to see you next time.